All right, so we're going to do a panel maybe a little bit differently than some of the other festival panels where people are, re are doing readings from their books. We're actually going to have a chat, a conversation around different issues around, around their books. And so we're going to start it off first with a quick round of, of introductions where each author is going to talk about what you do, a little bit about what you do, and a quick quick vignette of what motivated you to write this book, okay? And maybe we'll just start here and work our way down. Good morning. Thank you for coming out for this. This is wonderful. Um, I am, as Tanya said, I'm a veterinarian. That's uh, by trade. I'm a dog and cat veterinarian, and um, I'm also fascinated with the other books here because um, I also live on a farm and, and raise some chickens, so I'm eager to hear what everyone else has to say. So I was living in Alabama when I began writing this book and practicing as an emergency veterinarian. And um, the, the story that begins my, my love affair with freshwater mussels uh, is basically summarized by the title, Immersion. So I joined uh, an Auburn University field crew who were studying mussels uh, in snorkeling a creek in uh, just outside of Auburn, Alabama. And uh, one of those biologists happened to be my husband who was studying mussels for his degree. Um, but I had mostly uh, left those to his court until this day. Um, I happened to be about five months pregnant and uh, with some difficulty zipped a wetsuit over <laughs> my belly and, um, and knelt down into this creek that I had previously sort of perceived as just kind of a muddy creek that ran under a bridge that I drove over. Uh, but when I put my face into this creek, it transformed my way of seeing water and the world and um, the opportunity to watch uh, wild mussels doing their thing underneath the water um, completely blew my mind and uh, tripped a, a fascination with them. And I was very moved. And when I'm moved about something, I start writing about it. And so that's what happened. Um, and I kept writing. And at, at some point... Fairly early on, I realized I would need to admit out loud that I was writing a book about these uh, obscure bivalves, and I started talking with the biologists who shared my fascination, um, and everything went from there. Um, I entered this amazing world, and, uh, and it took off. Awesome. Thank you. I am so thrilled to be on this panel with these two other writers whose work I admire so much. So thank you all for coming out to share this with me. I can't wait to hear them talk about their work. So uh, I am, uh, as you might have guessed by that long list of places that I've written for, I am an independent journalist. I'm a freelancer and I, I write about public health and global health and food policy. And the shorter way to say that is that um, I'm fascinated by scary diseases <laughs> and by unintended consequences. And it was really those two interests that, that drove me into writing this book, which is the story of how we came to give antibiotics routinely to most of the meat animals on the planet, and how we discovered that was a terrible idea. Wrapped in the story of the rise of industrial scale poultry raising, and, and which is really the story of how we got the meat production system that we have today. <coughs> so the way that this came about is that uh, I was actually working on my previous book, which is called Superbug, as you heard, and it, Superbug is my attempt to tell the story of the emergence of antibiotic resistance around the world by relating effectively the biography of one organism, which is MRSA, or Drug Resistant Staph. And in reporting that book, I spent a lot of time with physicians and researchers and drug developers and um, people who had suffered from drug-resistant infections and the families of people who did not survive. And from those people I heard that antibiotics, which we take for granted because they have been there as long as we have all been alive, are precious and need to be protected and have to have their action conserved and that we're in danger of losing them. And while I was hearing that, I ran across this statistic that just knocked me back on my heels, which is that in the United States, in an average year, we sell four times as much antibiotic for use in livestock 
as we do for use in humans. And around the world, that proportion is at least two to one livestock to humans. And almost none of those livestock are actually sick. We're using the antibiotics to promote animals' growth and to protect them against the conditions that we keep them in. So I found myself faced with this conundrum. How was it that on the one hand, we could be saying that antibiotics are precious and have to be protected? And on the other hand, we could be allowing people to buy them in the United States until recently with no prescription at all, literally by going down to the farm supply store, and without any attention to what the consequences of that might be. And the, the, the tension, the contrast between those two poles is what drove me into writing this book. Thank you, Mary. Can you go to turn on? Yeah. Turn on the mic. Is this on? Is, no. yeah. Okay, it's, uh, it's on. Yeah. You need to talk right into it. Okay, good. Is this something you there you go. Okay. A volume at which you can all hear me? Okay. Well, I'm really very honored to be here this morning with Marin and Abby and Tanya, and I want to add my voice of thanks to all of you for coming out on a Friday morning to hear about animals and food. I think in some ways what really has excited me the most in the work that I do is a question that astrophysicists ask. As you know, there's a big endeavor to look for intelligent life in the universe, right? to ask, are humans here on Earth the only intelligent life in the universe? So people are spending a great deal of time and money and resources searching the stars. And I'm here to say there's intelligent life all around us, from chimpanzees to whales to ravens and crows to octopus. And I'm very fascinated by how science helps us understand how animals think and feel. And then what can the science of the cognition and emotion of animals do in helping us think through our ethical interactions with other animals? So I started out by observing monkeys in Kenya many years ago, went to the Smithsonian's National Zoo to look at groups of gorillas and to really immerse myself in the lives of some of these animals. And over time, I just became interested in more and more different types of animals. So after 28 years at that institution down the road, the College of William and Mary of Teaching Anthropology, I left the university to become a full-time writer and to write about animals. So Personalities on the Plate is my sixth book, and it came really out of some work I did for my fifth, which was called How Animals Grieve. I was writing about how monkeys and chimpanzees and parrots and whales love others, care for others in their groups, and they mourn when they die. And as I read, I started stumbling across more and more stories and information about animals we don't normally ask these questions of, like pigs and chickens and cows and goats, and I turned my attention to them. So I think what my motivation is, is to have a shift in perspective from thinking of just food animals. And I wanted to take readers on a journey that I myself am on, not being a vegan, not being a vegetarian, and eating some of these animals. How can we think about their lives when we put them on our plate? Very powerful. I'm getting chills from you three women. Um, I, I, I want to say maybe I'm out of line by saying this, but what I'm struck by is that the, the intersection of what you're talking about is reminds me so much of what Rachel Carson did way back many decades ago with Silent Spring, but what you are doing is this, it's, it's the new um, pulling back the veil on different aspects of the intersection of humans with the world around us, with, with um, muscles and how they are affecting our water quality and um, the antibiotics and, and how we think about the animals around us, right? So very important. It's, it's um, really the 21st century kind of investigation into our interaction with these animals. So thank you for doing this important work. Really mean that. Um, so my next question is, uh, writing often leads one to new insights and surprises and new perspectives. So in writing and investigating uh, and researching for your books, 
Is there something you learned that most surprised you or gave you a new perspective that you hadn't anticipated? So maybe we uh, start somewhere else. Maybe maybe we'll start this time with Marin. If, or if you want to pass, we can. No, no, that's okay. fine. Okay. That's fine. Um, so, so my book is a book about um, public health, and it's a book about how we got the food system that we have. And I, I think that, you know, if you think about the, the books or the pieces of media that have talked about the construction of our food system in the past 10 or 15 years, those are books like The Omnivore's Dilemma and Fast Food Nation. Uh, there, there's a pretty simple top line message of sort of food system bad. Um, which is not necessarily incorrect. But um, I wanted, coming from the public health side, to understand how we got there. And what was kind of a revelation to me is that the search for cheap protein, which is really what gave us the, the meat production system that we have today, which created a whole bunch of negative effects from uh, undermining animal welfare to uh, unexpected impacts on the environment to changes in the balance of power in farm labor between corporations and farm workers. All of those are unintended consequences. And, and all of those came surprisingly out of good intentions. So, so this is really, a, my, my journey through this story was really a story, a, a, a way of discovering how good intentions can go so terribly wrong. And what do we do to claw them back? And the, the, the book actually ends in somewhat of a happy ending that something's going well, which I'll, I'll talk about when we get a little further down the road. So I think we get a, a couple of more minutes now to talk about, what, about the, the details of our story. So let me tell you a few stories quickly. <clears throat> the way we got the food system that we have now with meat production supported so much by antibiotics turns out to date back to the end of World War II. To a point at which, because of the damage of the war, the system for food production was really damaged. Battles had rolled over arable fields, crops and herds had been decimated, <coughs> fishing vessels had been seized by navies to, to make up for the number of ships that had been sunk. And at the end of the war, there was a profound concern that the meat supply was really damaged. In fact, if you look back in American newspapers from 1946, from the first election after the end of the war, there are claims of a meat famine <coughs> across the country. It was actually in headlines in all the Midwestern newspapers. And that, those concerns of a meat famine were so significant that they actually affected some congressional races. So into that desire to heal the food system and to protect production comes one of the first manufacturers of one of the first antibiotics, a company called Letterly Laboratories, which was outside New York City, and, and a scientist named Thomas Jukes, who was a biologist who specialized in the, the nutritional needs of chicken. And in 1948, he was asked to do an experiment to find a new supplement that would be inexpensive to supplement the cheap feed that farmers had turned to giving their animals to cut costs to keep the food system from being overextended. He bought a bunch of just of baby chicks. He divided them up into groups, a very classic experimental design. He kept one group as a control group, and to the other group he gave every supplement he could find. Synthetic vitamins, cod liver oil, brewer's yeast, and to one group he gave the dra dried, ground-up remains of an antibiotic that his company had just begun manufacturing. The, a, an antibiotic called oreomycin, which is the first of the tetracycline class of antibiotics. And when he went to, to weigh those chicks, on Christmas Day, 1948, he did it himself because he'd given his lab tech the day off. He discovered that the chicks that had gotten the antibiotic leftovers weighed, had gained twice as much weight as any other chick in the experiment. So at that point, Farmers in the United States were not giving antibiotics to their animals at all. Within five years, the amount of antibiotic rose to 500,000 pounds. And now, just in the United States, it's almost 31 million pounds a year. And globally, it's about 262 million pounds. That's a lot of antibiotic washing around in the world. But, so of course, this company was looking for another way to sell its brand new drug. And, and of course the scientist was looking for, for fame and glory as scientists are acculturated to do. 
But beyond all that was, this, the, was the unintended consequences of wanting to democratize the eating of meat and make it available to as many people as possible, as inexpensively as possible. And at the time, that seemed like a good goal. And so this sense of people pursuing good goals and finding out that they had bad results it is a, a pattern that, that follows again and again and again through this story. Up until this point now, when we finally started to reckon with all of those negative results and figure out whether we can actually turn them back again. Yeah, yeah, let's go that way. Thank you, Maren. <laughs> can, you, can you do me a favor and just keep the mic closed up? Because just for the background noise. Absolutely. Thank you. This room way okay, back. Mary, we're going to have to, we're going to have to, when you talk again, we're going to make sure you hold it close. And please do, just wave. Yeah, just like, no. <laughs> okay. So I don't want to like spit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that mic works better than this mic. Uh, okay. This feels odd, but I'm, I know. Okay, I'd like to start with a question to you. How many people have watched Blue Planet 2 recently aired on American TV on BBC America? This is the show narrated by Sir David Attenborough about the creatures of the ocean. Okay, a few of you. This just finished on American television and it was an amazing look at the creatures of the ocean. And I want to describe one thing we saw on screen about octopus. There was a common octopus in the waters off of South Africa that became entangled with a shark called a pajama shark. And the shark was getting the best of the octopus and things didn't look good for team cephalopod, as I say, octopus is a cephalopod creature. But then the octopus took some of her eight arms and stuffed them into the gills of the shark so that the shark could not breathe. The shark released the octopus as any creature would who likes to breathe, and the octopus got away. The next thing that happened is that another shark came for the same octopus. And in this case, the octopus started pulling shells from the environment. She was right on the seafloor. There were shells. Pulling them over her body, adorning herself with a number of shells, and then hiding beneath this mound of armor that she had created. The shark came up and sniffed and sniffed, couldn't figure out what was underneath the shells, and the octopus jetted away. This really rocked my world because I've become fascinated with the creatures that we don't tend to think of as really, really smart. It's less of a surprise to many of us when chimpanzees, elephants, and dolphins do something smart. But what I really wanted to do in this book, and I have a whole octopus chapter in this book, <laughs> is write about animals, again, that we don't often think of in these terms. So the stories that I tell have not yet made it to the world of Sir David Attenborough, but they are very, I think, astounding in allowing us to see the animals with whom we share this earth. So I write about a chicken named Mr. Henry Joy, who was raised in North Carolina and turned out to have such a charismatic personality that he became stars of nursing homes and he would go around in a basket and cheer people up who needed some cheering and they would pet him and he would interact with them in really smart and emotional ways. I write about pigs who, if they are given problems to solve on a computer, outcompete little children. If you actually change the joystick of a computer so that it's workable by a snout <laughs> as well as by a hand, the pigs do much better than the kids. And some parents don't really like this. They were brought to a fair where the scientists who were studying pig cognition were and the kids lost to the pigs and some of the parents were grumbling about that. Pigs did very well. One of the most surprising things I learned was about fish, and you'll hear in a minute, learning about fish is particularly important for me. There's a group of three types of sea creatures, a grouper, a fish, an eel, a moray eel, and a rassi that hunt together. They hunt cooperatively together. In the way that we knew chimpanzees do and wolves do, but what happens is they're carnivores, and they're going after fish in the sea. And the groupers are the fast swimmers, but they're big. So sometimes the prey escapes in a crevice. And the grouper, being the fastest of the team, gets there and sees where the prey has disappeared, but can't fit. So it does something that, in the scientific world, is called an audience-specific referential gesture. <laughs> what that means is that the grouper does a headstand right over the crevice where the prey is and shakes but only does it 
when the eel and the rasse swim up. Only does it when there's a, an audience waiting to receive the gesture. And what happens at that point is that the eel being smaller or the rasse being smaller goes in and drags the prey out and the team eats. Not always. It's not always successful, but it's often successful. And that's, who, wow, who thinks of fish doing that? I didn't. I didn't. And I mentioned that this was important to me because I eat some fish. It's been a lot of years since I ate any chicken or cows or pigs or octopus, but I do eat some fish. And it's really made me stop and think. People tell me that it's distressing to hear about smart animals. And one thing I say in the book is that we like our chimpanzees smart and our elephants smart. So we can read headlines and watch documentaries about them. But we like the food on our plate, the animals on our plate, to be stupid because it's hard to hear. But what I was really wanting to do was talk to the reader about the journey that I feel I'm on in thinking about my food. So for example, last summer became the summer of vegan ice cream in our house. And we decided we'd experiment. And in my mind's eye, when I ate this <coughs> vegan ice cream, some of which I wouldn't recommend and others was absolutely delicious, were the cows that I had spent time researching, the cows in the dairy industry who repeatedly are separated from their offspring. And they mourn. They do feel this. These cows are not just going about their lives robotically. They have relationships with their sons and daughters, and they feel this. So sometimes it can be hard, but what I really think is important for us, and what I learned in doing this work, is that it's not an either or. We don't have to all be 100% carnivore or 100% vegan. Those are not the only choices, and those are not the only poles. And we can think of a spectrum. I'll talk more about this in a minute. But I did want to read just a very small passage to you about how important I think it is to just be collectively, I would say, brave enough, and I include myself here, to think about these animals. This was a study done by a research group, and I just want to read one paragraph of what these people learned. American study participants judged tree kangaroos to be less capable of suffering and less deserving of moral concern when they were told that tree kangaroos are consumed as food in Papua New Guinea, a particular country, than when they were told only that the animals lived there. In other words, there's two groups. You hear two different things. When you hear there's a nice animal called tree kangaroos and they live in this place, the other is the animals live there but they're eaten. All it takes to change people's perception of the intelligence of animals <coughs> is to label them as food. And this study has been important in my thinking, and there's other studies that are like it. So what I'm hoping people may think about in reading this book, as my subtitle, The Lives and Minds of Animals We Eat, says, is that Octopuses are tool users, chickens have personalities, fish can be really smart, and so on. And to take that into account as we think about the world around us. Thank you so much, Barbara. All right. To, to our last yes. Is this on? Okay. Um, I'm so completely enthralled by everything I'm hearing. I have to refocus I to... <laughs> I have to pull back and... Yeah. Um, so I, I think I can sort of summarize what was surprising <coughs> and um, some insights that I arrived uh, in two ways. And one was um, that I was surprised to truly realize that um, mussels are animals. And um, I had seen them in the laboratory in their tanks, and they really looked pretty inert to me. Um, they're completely housed in shells. They're bivalves. Um, they're distant relatives of the cephalopods, the octopus, um, they don't seem to do much when you look at them at first. And in fact, uh, I, one of the questions I asked early on was, um, my, of my husband was, how do you tell if they're alive or dead? <laughs> <laughs> and that can be a challenge. But um, I was very surprised to, to really connect with the liveliness of them, um, even holding a live muscle in your hand, even a closed shell, um, 
feels alive. There's a weight to it. Um, and they'll often squirt out just a little bit of water when you pick them up. And um, they, they have fascinating life histories. So, so life for a mussel, and as a veterinarian, I, I love to look at them as animals. Um, and life begins when the, the male mussel casts sperm just into the water and the female mussel draws it in through her, these apertures or siphons. Um, mussels are filter feeders constantly drawing the river through their bodies and she takes in particles to eat and she takes in sperm as well. She sorts them out, they meet the eggs and they form tiny larval babies and these um, are called glochidia. You can actually see them with the naked eye, but they look like flakes of dandruff. They're very tiny. And they're shaped like little tiny clams, little Pac-Man. And they're translucent. You can see them under a microscope. And they wait in her gills. So she broods them, and they call them marsupial gills um, because it's like a pouch. Um, and they fill up her gills, and they become bulging, and they wait. Sometimes they wait for a matter of weeks, and sometimes they wait almost an entire year. Her next job is to get these <coughs> larval babies onto the gills of a fish. For some mussels, this is a specific single fish species they require, and some mussels are more generous. So they can use multiple fish species. Um, but given that the mother mussel cannot move very fast, she can move, but not very fast, um, this would be a daunting task. So mussels have evolved with their fish species to lure the fish to them. And they have multiple, they've evolved multiple ways of doing this. Um, and it involves using part of their body as a mimic of the preferred prey of that fish. And so the female mussel will um, evert her mantle out of her shell and it will be um, decorated to look exactly like that preferred prey of the fish, whether it's a minnow complete with stripes and an eye spot and a tail, um, or worms or something that looks like a crayfish, and, um, and she'll wave that. And, and right in between that will be the marsupial gills containing the larval, larvae. In one species of mussel, they actually package the larvae to look like a minnow and they wave it out on a strand of mucus that can be up to three feet long and it, it, they, they go fishing um, for it. So they angle for the fish. So when the fish strikes what they think is the prey, it bursts these gills open and the, the tiny larval muscles clamp onto the gills of the fish. And that is required for them to transform into their free living, independent juvenile stage. And they ride around on the fish gills um, somewhat parasitically for about two weeks and then they drop off and the fish has allowed them to transform and transported them to a location separate from their parents. So um, in addition to this fascinating sex life, mussels um, are very intimately tied with the river itself. So filtering the river, living partly buried in the river bottom, they're, they're intimate with all aspects of river health. And so as a grew to love these mussels as animals, which incidentally have names um, such as monkey face, fat mucket, heel splitter, um, three-horned wartyback. Uh, <laughs> they, they're, they're poetically named for their shapes and, and formations. So, um, but they, I also grew fascinated with rivers and fresh water because the two are inextricable. And so the mussels, for their lives, rely on the river bottom being intact. They rely on the channel to guide appropriate speed and dynamics of the flow of the water so that they don't get washed away, um, so that excess sediment isn't brought into the, into the river. They rely on flows being preserved. So dams have been very damaging to mussels because it interrupts the natural flows of the river and it cuts them off sometimes from the host fish that they need to reproduce. Um, and in a drought, of course, if the mussels do not remain underwater, they, they basically die. Um, they can't breathe. And, and in a flood, they can get washed away and die as well. Water quality, water chemistry, 
contaminants in the water, chemicals, sediments, all of those things impact muscles. And so as I went on this quest to learn about these animals that I found fascinating, I found myself um, physically, literally, in the water supply, snorkeling in the water supply for, um, for our city. Um, and became fascinated with thinking about other places that I had lived and had I really known where that water physically came from um, into my tap and, and what was in it and what, what it looked like. Um, and so all of that uh, became, uh, and it sounds very simple, but <laughs> it became this, this revelation to me about the, you know, the, the creeks and rivers that were flowing under the bridges that I drove over um, being the actual water that I was uh, you know, that's that's in the picture that I'm that I'm serving my children. So um, this all became very connected and fascinating to me and um, and delightful um, more than depressing. Um, so um, so in in writing this book, I, I brought to it um, a lot of that fascination, even though freshwater mussels are among some of the most imperiled creatures on Earth. Um, and, and it is because of the damages to rivers. Um, it's also true that the southeastern United States is the global hotspot for freshwater mussel oh, diversity. So this is, yeah. including Virginia, um, is the, the rainforest for freshwater mussels globally. Um, so it's a very exciting place to be. It's fantastic uh, to hear these stories of, of what you learned along the way and um, what cap what captured and captivated you all. I, I think we're, we're really fortunate and lucky to have each of you sharing, sharing these stories with us because they're, they're so interconnected in terms of um, how, how we are impacting the world and the animals through the antibiotics and how we view them, how do we think about and how do we relate to them and what are they doing for us and what are their really hidden secret lives that who knew right about about their as you say their exciting sex lives so um and what they do to survive what they do to survive and to help clean our our rivers and streams for us so um, pretty pretty amazing thank you all for for sharing this um let me just do a quick um time check we're doing great um I have a last round of questions and we're going to open it up for questions and discussion with all of you is what is your and and this is a shorter shorter round um, what is your hope for how your book will influence others on a personal level as well as perhaps about policies um, around animals that are either raised for our plates or animals that are vital for our environmental health so let's start this time we'll start with I first want to say that I proved to myself this morning that I'm the eternal student because I'm taking notes about freshwater mussels. <laughs> I've got my notes. Um, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book called Evolving God, and I discovered that people were right when they said to me, if you're going to write about questions of faith and religion, um, religion and science, that yeah. people will be ignited. They will be either like it or they'll be mad at you, and they have a really good chance of being mad at you. <laughs> well, I discovered that that was true, but I also discovered that, wow, when you write about food, you're in a whole new territory. People really get engaged and also, at times, terribly upset when you talk about what people eat. And one of my fondest hopes for this book is I think I was successful, but this, of course, is for the reader to judge, is to be able to talk about these issues without a lot of finger-wagging and lecturing and saying, you should be eating this. You should be doing this. This is not a book of shoulds. It is rather saying, here I am as a person who's in the middle of thinking through these questions, eating some of the very animals that I'm writing about, although not very many. Almost all my meals now are vegetarian or vegan, and saying that, we can tap collectively into this compassion that so many of us feel for animals without being into the guilt and the accusation in terms of what this person is eating or that person is eating. There's, um, again, I think, the spectrum. If you know the word reducitarian, and the last time Marin and I were together was at what's called the Reducitarian Conference that was held in New York City in May. 
This is a term that is meant to unite people who are thinking about these questions, who may be eating less meat than they used to, may be vegetarian, may be vegan. If it's not a term that you know, it's associated with a man named Brian Caitlin, and it's a term that's worth looking up. And I, I am part of a collective of people writing and thinking about this on the spectrum of reducitarian, vegeta vegetarian, and vegan questions. But, you know, there's a lot of questions that we don't have time to talk about right now, but that I think should linger in the air as we move to the Q&A. For example, is it enough to say that we're going to avoid factory farms? Is it enough to say that we want to embrace small farms? For example, pigs that normally can live 15 years are routinely killed at six months, and that happens on farms, almost all farms. Is, is that okay? Is it okay that they have a good life and that they then die? Uh, what about insects? Do we want to embrace entomophagy? Do we want to move towards replacing some of the protein that we get from cows, chickens, pigs, and goats with, with insects? How do we deal with the need for the global acquisition of protein? What happens to these animals if we aren't eating them? We have so much to talk about. And I just want to be part of that conversation and to have it be, to the extent possible, a positive, open, welcoming, and inviting conversation, rather than shutting it down at the beginning with telling people what they should and shouldn't do. Thanks. So, OK, I've got it right up against my mouth now. There you go. There you go. So Big Chicken is a book that goes to some pretty dark places, but it actually ends up on a kind of hopeful note. Um, it's a book that ends up saying that change is possible, and I hope that's what people take away from it. Um, here are t just two quick examples. In the fall of 2014, the, the chicken company, Purdue, <coughs> who are based across the Chesapeake Bay in Delmarva, at, kind of out of nowhere, called a press conference in D.C. at the National Press Club. And the chairman, Jim Perdue, the grandson of the founder, son of Frank, uh, takes a tough man to make a tender chicken, who used to be in all the commercials. Jim Perdue stood up at this press conference and said, we have a message to impart. We're not using any antibiotics. In fact, we haven't been for almost a decade. And that announcement so shocked the rest of the poultry industry that they had to hasten to catch up with Purdue and now most of the poultry companies in the United States are functionally antibiotic free for at least some of for at least one brand within their portfolios if not entirely antibiotic free as Purdue is and Tyson is moving that way very quickly in January 2017 so a little more than a year ago in one of its last actions in office, the Obama administration made one significant form of antibiotic use in farm animals illegal in the United States, ending up a 40-year stalemate between the FDA and industry. Both of those changes happened because a, a, a vast disseminated consumer movement made it safe for the government and for industry to act. Starting in about 2010, <coughs> The University of California healthcare system told its the middlemen that sell to its industrial catering operations that they were no longer going to spend their catering dollars on meat raised with routine antibiotics because they considered that if that meat carried resistant bacteria, it would endanger their vulnerable patients. After the University of California, the Chicago Public Schools announced that they were going to do the same thing for any school breakfast or lunches. They were only going to buy antibiotic-free meat. And, and after them came coalitions of parents and families of people who'd had victims of drug-resistant illness in their families and farmers and organizations like the Chef's Collaborative. All of this consumer movement made it safe for the poultry companies to move and safe for the government to move because they knew there was a, a positive coalition waiting for them on the far side. After all, corporations don't do things for the most part out of public interest. They do it because they think they're going to earn money. And they knew there was a market waiting for them. Now, by no means is this problem solved, because chicken as an animal is relatively uncomplicated. They, they get dropped in a barn on their for, in, between the first and the, fir the third day of their lives, and they don't leave that barn until the night that they're going to be killed, which is usually about 42 days later. 
pigs and cattle are a lot more complicated organisms and they get moved around a lot more in their lives so they're potentially exposed to more pathogens. But pigs and cattle are moving to antibiotic free as well. So the, the, the question is how robust is this change driven by consumers going to be and can we persuade the very, what are now the largest economic, sorry, <coughs> agricultural powers in the world, which are mostly in the developing world, to follow the example of the United States and Western Europe who preceded us in, in banning antibiotics on farms. How can people do this themselves? If you go to almost any supermarket now, there will be antibiotic-free chicken in the cold case. It will say raised without antibiotics or no antibiotics ever. <coughs> chicken, that's actually as important as organic. Because in the United States, the organic standard for chicken starts on day two of the chicken's lives. So they could have gotten antibiotics in the shell or on their first days. Um, I take a lot of comfort in how much consumers, people who are, are buying, that, buying meat every day or every week, have started thinking about the, the lives of animals, about the ethics and of the ways in which animals are raised. And I think that that opens a space in the market for medium and smaller sized farmers to compete again in a way that they couldn't compete just on economics, on, on price, but they can compete on ethics. And I think all of this awareness is leading us to a food system where people are going to think harder about the, the lives of the animals that they end up eating and what the impact of those lives is on the environment, uh, on farm labor, on land use, uh, even on family structures, and that will lead us to a healthier food system in the end. So I think that um, you know, connecting our possibly conundrums in, in writing these books, um, hoping to write about some serious, important, compelling issues without being um, either preachy or too dark. Um, I faced a similar challenge um, in writing about the most imperiled group of animals um, and the the way they suffer from the damages to rivers that then um, endanger our very our very fresh water supply that we rely on for life. Um, so how not to make that depressing? Um, and and the, the thing about it was that um, my journey in learning about mussels and rivers was not depressing. Um, and so I, my hope in writing this book uh, is that it will serve as um, an invitation to indulge in curiosity and wonder and delight at the same time, you know, learning about some of the realities of our rivers and fresh water but through the lens of um, some animals that, yes, are, are imperiled, but are also um, pretty hardy and resistant and amazing. And that um, by focusing and gearing some of our, our efforts in protecting and restoring rivers towards making them better for mussels, we it will naturally follow that we make them, the rivers themselves, more resilient and healthy um, and able to provide um, clean, fresh water for the future of us. And this is happening. Um, it's not pie in the sky. This, uh, this is happening even in the beautiful state of Alabama, um, which is um, rich with aquatic biodiversity, um, but makes headlines for many other things. The uh, one example that is one of my favorites is um, in northeastern Alabama, the Paint Rock River. Uh, by the mid-1980s, the Paint Rock River was pretty beat up. Uh, it flows um, out of some forests, but down through an agricultural valley. Um, and it, it took a beating through uh, forestry and logging, um, agricultural practices, and just uh, the watershed itself uh, was, was pretty rough. And the natural fish and mussel diversity had just tanked, uh, or so it seemed. But over um, some years of collaborative restoration efforts focused on the watershed and spearheaded by the Nature Conservancy, whether it was um, stream bank restoration, changes in, in creating buffers between the, the agricultural lands and the, the watershed, the Paint Rock River 
has returned to, um, to amazing. It now hosts over 100 <coughs> fish species and 45 mussel species, including 12 uh, globally imperiled species. And so um, having, having visited there, um, you really feel the richness that can come from a healthy river. And, and now the river can also provide uh, better flows and better water for the surrounding community. And that was a collaborative effort involving a lot of people working together. And I really think that that can be the future um, for rivers and that um, bringing stories of rivers and animals that are um, that are hopeful and interesting, as opposed to simply um, dark and and worrisome, um, can can help inspire us as well. Thank you all so much. Uh, I think, if nothing else, my hope is that that these authors with their incredible stories and pulling back the veil on this aspect of our world that we often sort of bumble through and don't don't think about in our daily lives that that raising this awareness among you all is part of the ripple effect of, of the impact of their writing the thing that I love is is that they are all ultimately hopeful stories is that is that through raising awareness of of these aspects of our impacts on our world and our relationships with these animals and and how we've affected them, how they're affecting us, that we, you're telling stories of how we can actually change and improve that those interactions and relationships and lives. So it's your turn. Uh, we